So, with Chapter 13 of Two Blue Vortex officially out for a couple of days now, and with me home with my good camera and my non-microwave mic, I feel as though it's time we sit down and have some long-needed conversations about what truly went down in this chapter. And while there are a lot of things we could talk about from Chapter 13, I think we're all in agreement that the most important topic to talk about after the conclusion of Chapter 13 is the existence of a fifth Shinju. See, because while this fifth Shinju doesn't necessarily exist quite yet. While well, Kashin Koji was explaining how the 10 paths Shinjutsu works that allows him to see all possible futures, we saw in one of the images being displayed to us of futures that either were going to come to pass or were avoided that there were five Shinju and the fifth Shinju looked pretty instantly recognizable. However, those images were just from the future. They hadn't come to pass quite yet. However, with the conclusion cliffhanger of chapter 13 being that the four Shinju were creating the fifth Shinju, it seems as though that fifth Shinju that we saw from the future images of Kashin Koji is gonna take a big step to center stage. And if the fifth Shinju we're about to see is the same one we saw from the Ten Shadows prediction of Kashin Koji, then based off the track record of the Shinju looking kind of like the person the claw grind bit, then we got a couple of pretty key hints already as to who this Shinju might be. And while in my chapter 13 breakdown, I said unequivocally that Shinju's identity ties back to Baryon Mode Naruto, it's since been brought to my attention multiple times, mind you, that Shinki is a character who exists in this story. And boy, oh boy, is that something I did not remember. Oh, I'm sorry, you want the character who showed up during the tuning exams and then only existed in anime-only filler for the rest of their tired existence in this IP to be at the front of my brain at all times? Yeah, I get it, he's cool, but he's basically Kagura 2.0. An interesting character who operates a bit like a character from Naruto's past who shows up for all of, oh, I don't know, three chapters, and then plays a much bigger role in the anime-only part of the story. Considering Shinki is a possible fifth Shinju 13 chapters into two blue vortex when we haven't seen him since chapter 20, of part one isn't necessarily something I had on my Boruto bingo card. But honestly, the resemblance is, it's, it's, it's pretty close. But then again, ironically, the resemblance is also pretty close to Naruto's Baryon mode. And considering the fact that the Shinju is an adult and not a child, makes it seem as though I might have been correct in my primary assertion. However, considering the fact that we haven't seen Shinki in three years and God knows what they feed them over there in the Land of Wind. I mean, Tamari and Kankuro being everybody else's age during the tuning exams was wild. I mean, I guess they're a little bit older than Gara, but I think Gara was younger than everybody. And they all came back just like men and women but then i guess everybody grew up but still all i'm saying is we haven't seen chinky in a long time he might be adult ish like the rest of the konoha the seven i still haven't memorized how many characters are in the new gen i think it's seven including sumerai if you don't count metal lee because who does? But anyways, when it boils down to it, it seems as though the community has decided that the fifth Shinju is either Baryon Mode Naruto or Shinki. And today, I want to talk about both of those possibilities, how they could have come to pass, and what they would mean for the future of this story. Because today, we're talking the identity of the fifth Shinju revealed. But before we get to doing any of that, guys, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And if you're feeling particularly generous, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weave Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime and manga. Or if you want to see me try to bring real-life challenges to the anime world, go ahead and follow my brand new project that I created with Stephen Heat, Chris Barnett, and Danny Mata called Anime IRL. Or if you just want to hear me talk about anime and manga a little bit more, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Talk Who's Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. But before we get into all that, Today, we're going to talk about our favorite recurring sponsor to the page, Fume. Flavored air is quickly becoming the leading alternative to vaping and smoking, and that charge is led by Fume. It's kickstarting a whole new movement towards better habits. But how and why? Well, Fume is an award winning flavored air device that draws flavor to your mouth. It helps fill the void that ditching a bad habit can leave, giving you something to reach for. But it's not a vape, there's no vapor which means you can use it anywhere. And there's no nicotine, which means it's non-habit forming. All you gotta do is take one of these flavor cores, slip it into your fume, put this wooden piece over it, and boom, you're ready to go with flavored air of 
Tons of different flavors. Oh, that's good, maple pepper. And all of the flavors are non-toxic, so it's all guilt-free. On top of that, as fume is powered by your breath, there's no batteries, so nothing to charge. On top of that, its metal and wood design looks awesome and gives it weight, so it's fun to fit you with. It's got magnets in it, which make it fun to slip up and down, and it's got this little salt pepper twister thing that allows you to control how much air comes in and out of it. Fume has served over 300,000 customers, and you can be the next success story they serve. For a limited time, use my code NCHAMMER to get your free topper. It's the perfect accessory for your Fume. All you have to do is slip it on the mouthpiece for a softer, warmer feel. It's chewable for those who love the fidget, and it's reusable. So head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use code NCHAMMER, or scan the QR code on screen right now to get your free Fume Topper today with purchase of the Journey Pack. So what do we say, folks? It's about time we start kicking those bad habits. So sometimes when Nick says things out loud, they're not 100% accurate. You know this. You know these things we theorize. They're all theories. They're hypotheticals. And while sure, a lot of the time my theories are so accurate, they might as well be concrete evidence. Like Kosh and Koji having future sight, mind you. Let's not lose sight of the good things I've done recently. Sometimes, uh... I you know. Sometimes you see stripes on a face and you think, oh, the only person with stripes on their face in Boruto is Baryon Mode Naruto. And then the entire collective internet goes, you forgot about Gara's adoptive son. And if I could defend myself for one second, honestly, I thought Kishimoto forgot as well. And yet when it boils down to it, while Shinki is a very, very legitimate contender for the identity of the fifth Shinju here, I still feel roughly split. Though my community poll is not. And I also want to talk about the reality of either of these possibilities being true. And since Baryon Mode Naruto was my first guess, and apparently, according to my community poll, the less likely outcome, let's start with the eighth Hokage. See, one of the biggest problems we established when we were breaking down chapter 13 and everything that happened was that I was 100% assured that the fifth Shinju was Baryon Mode Naruto, based off looks. However, as to how that would happen in the story, I did have some pretty major question marks. See, Baryon Mode Naruto isn't necessarily a character. It's a form, and an ephemeral one at that. Now, unfortunately, forms in the Naruto universe are a bit of a rarity. The only people who really have forms are sages, Jinchuriki, and people from Jugo's clan, who are, like, kind of sages. And that's all the other Shinju weren't created from people with forms. You could stretch the argument and say that Jura came from a person who had forms, as Jigen was able to turn into Ishiki, but... That doesn't feel right. And thus, we don't know if somebody who was bitten, who had access to multiple different forms, would manifest as their base form or their strongest form. If Kashin Koji was bit, would he manifest as his sage mode form or his base form? If Juga was bit, would he manifest as his human form or his nature energy controlled form? If Naruto was bit, would he manifest as his base form or as his Baryon mode form? We can't necessarily say. However, it feels somewhat safe to assume that if a Shinju did manifest from a Jinchuriki, and a perfect one at that, that after the claw grime bit the Jinchuriki in question, the Shinju that would form would manifest with both the aspects of the Tailed Beast and the Jinchuriki. See, because while we're still not 100% certain on how Shinju were formed, it's rather clear and obvious that the chakra of the person bitten by the claw grime plays into the Shinju created. And since the Jinchuriki, and especially a perfect Jinchuriki, are essentially two chakra forms melding into one, especially in the case of Baryon Mode, then it would make sense that the Shinju who's manifesting from this melding of chakra would have both the aspects of a tailed beast and the Jinchuriki in question. And thus, if Naruto were to be hypothetically bit by a claw grime, it would make sense that his manifested form would look a bit like the fifth Shinju. As mind you, a Shinju is just a walking divine tree created from the chakra of the entity the claw grime bit. And, and therefore, with a tentative body in a divine tree lineage, it would make sense that Naruto would possibly manifest as his strongest form. This still doesn't answer the incredibly large and important question. 
How? Naruto's in the Daikoku Ted. There's no claw grimes in the Daikoku Ted. Not even that. We've seen Naruto in the Daikoku Ted, and he's certainly not growing roots. And yeah, you're super right. Naruto and Hinata replacing the Daikoku Ten long before Code perfected the modified claw grime who would go on to create the Shinju. The earliest we know of the existence of these modified claw grimes was a year after Naruto and Hinata being placed in the Daikoku Ten. And therefore, the idea that Naruto somehow in some extra dimension pocket of space that Kawaki controls somehow got bit by a claw grime and was able to pass that chakra down through the roots of a divine tree to a different dimension is kind of insane. And then somehow that divine tree that grew around Naruto wasn't noticed by Kawaki when he was sitting there looking at Naruto. Unfortunately for you and me, that's not at all what I'm saying. Obviously that's asinine. Kawaki would have to let a claw grime into the Daikoku Ten, and since the Daikoku Ten is a timeless dimension, even if he did let a claw grime in, the second it went into the dimension, it would just freeze. It wouldn't be able to bite Naruto. And so if there is a Shinju running around with Naruto's Baryon mode face, that's certainly not how it happened. So then, how did it happen? Well, fortunately for anybody who's trying to make this argument, definitely not me. Shinju are still, by and large, a massive mystery. Well, Chapter 13 was pretty big for figuring out how Shinju were created. At the same time, all of the exposition given to us in Chapter 13 really only served to complicate the process more. While previously to Chapter 13, we simply believed that a claw grime bites a human, and then after biting that human, a part of that tree splits off into a Shinju, it's now been revealed that some giant divine tree-esque mechanism creates soul thorns, and then that divine tree gives life to those soul thorns, and that divine tree might be controlled by the Moegi Shinju. But the idea of the Moegi Shinju being the one who controls the roots of the divine tree to create more Shinju poses the question of how was the Moegi Shinju created? It also poses the question of was the Moegi Shinju the first Shinju? I find it slightly hard to believe that Moegi, who was attacked in chapter one of Two Blue Vortex, was bit before Bug, who had to live around modified claw grimes for years. But if the Moegi Shinju is the one plucking soul thorns and using Using the roots of this tree to repair the likes of Hidari and build out new Shinju, then we can't help but scratch our heads and ask, was she the first? And if she was the first, how was she created? And if she was the first, why isn't she in charge? Why is it Jura? And if Jura truly is the Ten Tails, like we believe Jura is the Ten Tails, that would imply that he was made last, as Moegi, Bug, and Hidari all saved the Ten Tails together. Now, if I had to guess on how a Shinju was created, I would tie back a theory to an idea that I had a couple of weeks ago. The idea that since not only one, but two divine trees have grown across the entirety of the globe, that under the earth of the Naruto world, there is a giant interconnected web of divine tree roots. And that whenever a modified claw grime bites into somebody and grows a failed divine tree, the roots of that failed divine tree tap back into this giant interweaving web of divine tree roots. All of which lead back to what is now being known as the Shinju headquarters, where the black box exists. And therefore, whenever somebody is bit and a certain amount of time passes, the chakra of that person is slowly but surely compartmentalized down into a soul thorn. A soul thorn which can be given life by somebody augmenting it with the roots of this mother divine tree. Now, this still creates the question of how was the first Shinju made, and we'll probably learn that sometime in the future, but that's not necessarily the question we're trying to answer right now. The important takeaway here is that when enough chakra in the form of a human being being bitten by a modified claw grime is absorbed into what we'll lovingly call the divine tree root system, eventually a soul thorn will be produced in the Shinju headquarters. And while usually the absorption of this level of chakra would require somebody being caught in a failed divine tree for a long amount of time, mind you, Sasuke has been in the divine tree for two years and Hidari just now began to exist, Naruto's been in a couple of scenarios that no other character in the story has ever come close to. And while one of those scenarios is Baryon mode, obviously, another one of those scenarios is Naruto, having his chakra drained from his body while tied up on a god tree. And both of those scenarios can introduce some interesting wrinkles in Boruto's storyline. But let's first talk about Baryon mode. See, we've explained how Baryon mode operates multiple times. But in the simplest of terms, Baryon mode operates like nuclear 
fusion. Naruto and Kurama collide in their chakras to create a new, higher form of energy. Now, rather interestingly, the reveal that Kurama is still alive inside of Himawari throws a couple of wrenches into our understanding of how Baryon Mode works. So far as we understood, Baryon Mode was going to eradicate Kurama's existence, as all of the energy that was Kurama was going to be expended in this nuclear fusion reaction. And objectively, that's kind of what we were told. However, now, three or so years after the conclusion of Baryon Mode's awesome power in its battle against the Ishiki, Kurama has at least slightly reformed inside of Himawari. Now, the reason that I say at least slightly is because Kurama's power hasn't seemed to fully manifest inside of Himawari. Kurama's power takes a long time to re-manifest, and while it had been established that usually if a Chinchuriki dies, it takes about three years for the tailed beast to reform, Kurama's got a whole lot of power, and therefore he exists in a chibi form inside of Himawari. And it's probably safe to assume that as Tubu Vortex goes on and Himawari's more fleshed out as a character, she'll gain access to more and more of Kurama's chakra. However, that also may not be a possibility for her. See, we still don't super have a concrete answer as to why Kurama settled down inside of Himawari, but Kurama did give us a couple of possible theses, and those are probably the best we'll ever get. So basically, what we're conventionally accepting as the reason that Kurama settled down inside of Himawari is because she, as Naruto's child and a third generation child of Kurama, held on to the highest fraction of Kurama's chakra on Earth and therefore, kind of like a magnet, acted as the well that Kurama's chakra came back to settle down into. But like I just said, she doesn't appear to have all of Kurama's chakra, even though it's been years since his chakra was expended. Now, the fact that Naruto was colliding his chakra with Kurama's to create a nuclear fusion reaction to up their energy isn't the only interesting thing about Baryon Mode. See, because chakra is being destroyed, it's not actually being destroyed, its form is being changed. In a Baryon Mode reaction, whenever Naruto comes into contact with somebody else, he also destroys their chakra. But since the elaboration on how Baryon Mode works makes it more in line with real-life thermodynamic principles, that is to say that energy cannot be created or destroyed, our understanding of Baryon Mode and how it affects those hit by it also has to be adjusted. See, because Ishiki's energy wasn't being destroyed when Naruto was coming into contact with him, but rather, more likely than not, just being added into the equation of nuclear fission. Fusion. My bad. That is to say, kind of like Hinata's twin lion fists, whenever Naruto was coming into contact with Ishiki, he was absorbing Ishiki's energy and clashing it into his and Kurama's. However, because that reaction was happening in Naruto's body and not Ishiki's, Ishiki was losing energy and Naruto was gaining it. Now, this inevitably led to Ishiki's timer being cut down until eventually he only had a couple of minutes to find Kawaki. However, this does mean in some grand sense of the word that Ishiki, Kurama, and Naruto Naruto's chakra was all being melded together. And as we saw that when that energy, this new higher form of energy was used up through Baryon mode, that the components used to create that higher form of energy didn't remain inside of Naruto as obviously Kurama floats away into a cloud. It's safe to reckon that all of the components used to create Baryon mode didn't stay within Naruto. Because while you can sit here and say, but Naruto's chakra came back to him because it's his chakra. Whenever you use chakra, it always comes back to you. I mean, you could make the exact same argument for Kurama's chakra, as Kurama was sealed inside of Naruto, and Naruto has been expending Kurama's chakra for years, and it always comes back to him. And thus, it's somewhat safe to assume, and I say somewhat, because who knows, that the chakra expended through the battle with Baryon Mode floated outside of Naruto as an expended higher form of energy that later broke back down into its key components. Those being in order of density, Kurama's chakra, Naruto's chakra, and Ishiki's chakra. But as we saw, it took Kurama multiple years to re-manifest in even a small form. The breakdown of the byproduct of the energy reaction that we saw from Baryon mode could have taken a while. And therefore, by the time that Naruto's chakra would have returned back to him after the components of Baryon mode broke down, he was already locked in the Daikokuten. And therefore, this Baryon mode energy of Naruto is floating around with really nowhere to go. But this isn't a novel concept. Chakra is detached from humans all the 
the time. The chakra of all things is interconnected. This is something we're told all the time. And therefore, when a human dies, their chakra returns back to nature. And therefore, this massive well of chakra, probably much greater than any human holds on to outside of Naruto, immediately floats off into the universe and has nowhere to resettle, could settle back to Earth itself, creating a force of such magnitude that when it's absorbed by the Earth and returns to nature energy, that because of the specific circumstances of the Divine Tree root network being reactivated by the presence of the Shinju, that this energy could re-manifest as a soul thorn. And while that sounds 100% ridiculous, think about the other events that have happened somewhat coincidentally within the last 12 to 24 hours. Kurama finally gathered enough chakra inside of Himawari to manifest. Kurama, whose demise was actively tied to Baryon mode. On top of that, Kurama's manifestation, which should have taken place a significant amount of time after his own destruction through the form of Baryon mode to be fully re-manifested, comes in the form of a weaker, chibi-like version. A form so weak that none of the sensor ninjas inside of Konoha were able to detect Kurama's presence. Something that all of them should have been on alert for, considering the fact that Hokage was the person who walked around with Kurama's presence, and he got murdered three years ago. And thus, the manifestation of the components of Baryon mode started rather conveniently just a couple of hours before this fifth soul thorn was created. But Nick, you're being ridiculous. Why would they use Naruto instead of Shinki? Well, we're all sitting here scratching our beards thinking, well, if Sasuke is able to get the soul thorn of Hidari, maybe he'll be able to heal his body and get two Rinnegan, right? And Sasuke will be able to re-enter the fold and contribute in the battle against Shibai at the end of Two Blue Vortex. In fact, a large reason a lot of us think that Sasuke was caught in the Divine Tree in the first place is so that he could be un- nerfed, and that the nerf that Sasuke and Naruto received halfway through part one of Boruto was just to keep them out of the story for a little while. And so now that we have the answer as to how Sasuke is going to come back into the fold of the story and be stronger than ever, a lot of us put on our thinking caps and we thought, oh, but how is Naruto gonna get stronger? He's an empty vessel. He can become a ten tails Shinchuriki, but now the ten tails is gone in the form of Jura. And he's more interested in Himawari and Kawaki than he is Naruto now. Okay, not great. Doesn't exactly stoke the flames of the Naruto's gonna become the Ten Tails Shinshuriki fire. On top of that, Kurama's re-manifesting inside of Himawari. So the idea of Naruto getting Kurama back <laughs> doesn't seem super likely. However, what if, and take a little walk with me on this one, if you shall, we can hold hands, but not interlock fingers. I have a girlfriend. It's platonic. Our walk, not my lovely girlfriend. What if the strongest form that Naruto ever used re-manifests as a soul thorn, which is then later manifested in to a Shinju. If we're going through with the idea that the way to save Sasuke and to unnerf him is to fuse him with a soul thorn created from his own chakra, would it be the craziest thing to assume that Naruto could undergo the same thing. I mean, we're talking about a Shinju created from the energy of Baryon mode. Not only would this explain why Kurama hasn't fully manifested in Himawari because a majority of his energy is still tied into the Baryon mode reaction that's currently being manifested into a Soul Thorn, but also this would allow for both Himawari and Naruto to be Chinchuriki of Kurama simultaneously. But Nick, how would that work? Great question. See, it's very clear and obvious that Himori doesn't have access to the entirety of Kurama's chakra. However, it's been established, and I believe rather purposely, that Himori has a much higher affinity for Kurama's chakra than anybody else in previous history. So much so that Jura has identified Himori as closer to the Shinju than that of a standard Jinchuriki. And thus, Himori seems to have a level of power that's able to rival Jura. At least, she will eventually. And thus you could genuinely make the argument rather easily that Himawari will never actually need access to the entirety of Kurama's chakra. It seems as though with a little bit of training she'll be able to use the amount of power she currently has to become a force of nature, which opens the door to the rest of Kurama's chakra, which isn't gonna go to Boruto. Stop saying it is. That just doesn't make sense. It's thin theme-wise, and it goes against everything we know about Boruto. However, if I'm Kishimoto and I want to win points with my fan base, having Kurama and Naruto have a tearful reunion as they both lock into some version of a semi-permanent Baryon mode would just destroy the internet. And if we're able to get that reunion in the manifestation of this form by a Shinju being created from the energy of Baryon mode that's later fused to Naruto, who possibly awakens Rinnegan because of it, yeah, I think I could live 
live with that future. And yeah, I'm sorry, that story from a hype perspective and uh, based off the evidence we have thus far perspective just kind of makes more sense to me than Shinky. And when you tie this into the fact that this isn't even the first time that Naruto's had a massive amount of his chakra pulled out of his body and then kind of dispelled, as it also happened to him in the battle against Momoshiki who was able to pull out half of his and Kurama's chakra, all the while Naruto was tied to a divine tree and then Momoshiki went on to die, which would cause his chakra, or at least the chakra he stole from Naruto to dispel back into the universe and possibly into the divine tree that Naruto was tied to, at least a little bit, then the idea that somehow enough of Naruto's chakra has been displaced into the universe that eventually a god tree would be able to manifest a Naruto Shinju isn't the craziest thing you've ever heard. But of course, Unfortunately, the idea of it being Shinky, unfortunately, makes way more sense. See, Kishimoto was kind of an odd writer. I guess the better word is unpredictable. Sometimes he'll go with the most absolutely convoluted answer you've ever dreamt up in your entire life. While other times, just like Occam's Razor, the simplest answer is usually the best one. And I'll tell you right now, the idea that the Claw Grimes made it to the Land of Wind and one of them bit Shinky is a lot less of a jump in logic. Because, like I said, yes, the Shinju was an adult, but we also haven't seen Shinki in three years. The eye markings of the Shinju go around his eye and below his eye in a big, bold line. Shinki's facial markings are more square, while Naruto's facial markings are more pointy. And while both Shinki and Naruto kind of have the exact same hairstyle, if this was supposed to be a manifestation of Naruto's Baryon mode, then it would kind of make sense that it would have ears of some sort. And yet the Shinju seems to have a buzz cut with no flapping fox ears. However, I will say, rather interestingly, not only do those square-like protrusions under the fifth Shinju's eye not go to a second set of square-like protrusions like they would with Shinki, but they're also connected to his hair like with Baryon Mode Naruto. Tie this into the fact that he decidedly has pointier ears than all the other Shinju. And maybe, just maybe, that's Kishimoto saying, well, he may not have ears on top of his head, but he's got pointy ears on the side of his head. But yeah, no, the idea that a claw grind made to the Land of Wind in Bit Shinki is not the craziest thing of all time. Especially when you consider the fact that large swaths of Boruto very closely resemble the plot of Naruto, and that the early part of part two of Naruto is heavily focused on Gara. And so to assume that Shinki, who's basically Gara for the new jet would get reintroduced in the story after being introduced in the tuning exams kind of just like gara in the early parts of part two would make a fair amount of sense however small problem here who does a shinky shinju want to consume is it boruto because that kind of confuses the plot needlessly that's just adding another shinju who wants to beef with boruto creating three now oh well he'd want to consume gara obviously hey man gara's not in this story well he could go for like shikamaru or tamari also dumb a naruto baryon mode shinju would have a fair amount of reason to want to consume kawaki who currently as wild as it sounds isn't on any of the shinju's shit list bug wants ada moegi wants konohamaru Juro wants Shikadai or Himawari or Boruto, and Hidari wants Sarada. Nobody wants Kawaki. Why would a Shinki Shinju want Kawaki? I get it. I get that he looks like Shinki, but I think there's better plot reasoning for it being Baryon Mode Naruto. And if your theorizing stops at physical looks, well then, you're dead in the water. You'll believe. You'll believe. It's Baryon Mode Naruto. <sighs> When it gets revealed in a month that it's Shinky, I'm gonna be really upset. But if it's not, I'm gonna be insufferable. So bad for you either way, but you follow me. So you did this to yourself, but I'm curious to hear. Now that I've laid out all the points for you, genuinely, who do you believe is the fifth Shinju? Tell me in the comments below and why you guys are down there, please, for me. Like this video, subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell. I'm gonna go to a beach rave with a bunch of OnlyFans models. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs>